There once was a poor country man whose only inheritance to his three sons was his farm, his donkey, and his cat. The eldest son inherited the farm, the second eldest the donkey, and the youngest son inherited the cat. What on earth will I do with a cat? I can barely feed myself, said the youngest son. Let alone, how can I offer this pet anything? I have no money and am so poor. Don't worry, said the cat. If you can get me a sack and a pair of boots, you will see I am the most valuable thing your father ever owned. The son brought the cat what he asked for, as he knew he had nothing to lose. The cat put on the boots and took the sack to catch a plump rabbit. The cat wore the boots on his journey. He would be called Puss in Boots. He caught a plump rabbit and brought it to the king. Puss in Boots told the king the plump rabbit was a gift from his master, the Duke of Carabas. For several weeks, Puss in Boots brought the king many gifts from his master. The king was very curious about Puss in Boots and his master, the Duke of Carabas. But the king knew that the duke was friendly and had the most well-behaved cat he had ever met. The king did not know that Puss in Boots had made up the name Duke of Carabas for his poor master. One day, the king and his daughter were riding in their carriage by the river. Puss in Boots told his master to take off his pants and shirt and jump in the river. His master agreed to do so. Then Puss in Boots yelled out, Help! Help! The Duke of Carabas is drowning! As the king's coach passed by him, the king ordered his driver to stop, and he told his guards to rush over and save the Duke of Carabas. The king saw Puss in Boots yelling and knew he must help him as he had been so generous to the king. Puss told the king the duke's clothes had been stolen. So the king offered the duke a fine suit of his own clothes to put on. The duke of Carabas got in the carriage for a ride. The king's daughter quietly told the duke he looked very handsome. <laughs> The Duke looked at her and told her she was very beautiful. <laughs> Along the way, Puss had asked all the farmers and workers on the road, if the king drives by, you must tell him the owner of all these lands is the Duke of Carabas, or the uh -huh. ogre who lives in the uh -huh. castle will eat you. All the farmers and workers answered when asked that the Duke of Carabas was their landowner when the king asked them. Puss in Boots ran ahead to the ogre's castle and asked the ogre about the trick he could do by changing into a small mouse from a big ogre. Puss in Boots told the ogre no one believed he could do a trick like that. The ogre said, watch me, as he turned into a small little mouse. <laughs> Puss in Boots grabbed the mouse and ate it up. And that was the end of the big bad ogre. Just then, the king's carriage arrived at the castle gate. Puss in Boots ran to meet the carriage and said, Welcome to the castle of the Duke of Carabas. His master could not believe what was happening. On the long ride in the carriage, he had fallen in love with the king's daughter. And Puss in Boots had planned everything to work out perfectly. The Duke asked the king if he could marry his daughter. And the king said, yes, of course. The Duke of Carabas and the princess were married and lived happily ever after in their castle. 
Puss in Boots was named a great lord and never had to hunt for mice ever again. Puss in Boots proved he was the best inheritance as he had promised his master. Once upon a time, a lovely mermaid named Ariel rescued a drowning prince from a shipwreck. Ariel's father had forbade her to swim to the surface, but she had to to save the prince. Ariel wanted to be part of the human world so badly. Somehow she would find a way. As she touched the prince's face, she wished with all her heart that she could stay on the beach and dance with this man of her dreams. As the prince lay unconscious, she sang to him. What would I do to see you smiling at me, she sang. Her father's trusted friend tried to convince Ariel that being under the sea was her home and she would be much happier living her life there instead of the human world. The Sea King had asked his friend to keep an eye on his daughter. But despite all the king's friend's efforts, he could not convince her because she was in love with the prince. The fish, her only best friend, was the only one who understood her. Her fish friend surprised Ariel with a statue of the prince that had sunk with the shipwreck. Oh, thank you so much, my friend, Ariel said. The statue looks exactly like him. Just then, her father the Sea King found Ariel in her secret grotto with her collection of things from the world above the sea. He destroyed all of her treasures in an attempt to protect her from the dangers of the human world. Ariel was so upset. She sought out the help of the Sea Witch. The Sea Witch made a deal with Ariel. In exchange for the mermaid's voice, the witch would transform Ariel's mermaid tail into legs. The Sea Witch told Ariel she would remain human only if she received a kiss of true love before the sunset on the third day. As Ariel wiggled her newly found toes, the Sea King's trusted friend knew he had to tell the king but he knew Ariel would be so sad as a mermaid. The king's friend agreed to help Ariel find the prince. Ariel's seagull friend helped her find a dress, and it wasn't long before the prince arrived. You are the one, he exclaimed. The one I have been searching for. <laughs> Ariel nodded but could not speak. But the girl who rescued me had the most beautiful voice, said the prince. Perhaps you are not the girl I have been searching for. Still, the prince helped her to the castle and they had dinner that night. Ariel made the prince laugh for the first time in weeks. He showed her around his kingdom the next day and was enchanted by her enthusiasm for everything from horses to puppet shows. The prince thoroughly enjoyed Ariel, and that night, they went for a quiet, romantic boat ride. As the prince leaned in to kiss Ariel, the sea witch made her pet eels tip the boat. Then the sea witch hypnotized the prince and transformed herself, pretending to be his mysterious dream girl. She arranged a wedding right away to make sure all of Ariel's plans would fail. Ariel's seagull bird friend gathered all of her ocean friends to help Ariel defeat the sea witch's evil plans. Her friends fought the sea witch and won, and Ariel's voice was restored. 
and the spell on the prince was broken. He realized Ariel was his true love, but it was too late, and Ariel was a mermaid again. The evil sea witch dragged Ariel back into the sea, but the strong prince would not lose his true love again, and he fought and destroyed the evil sea witch. The sea king and his trusted friend watched, and the sea king could see how much his daughter loved the prince. So, he granted her wish to marry the prince. All of Ariel's great sea friends applauded as the prince and Ariel were married, and they lived happily ever after. One day, the infant son of research scientists who were working in the jungle wandered off when they were not looking. The small baby boy was found by Bagheera the very nice black panther. Bagheera thought the baby would be safer with the wolves and their baby cubs. Bagheera left the baby for the mother wolf to find. The mother wolf named the boy Mowgli and they agreed to raise the boy with her wolf cub. Mother wolf always worried about Shere Khan the great tiger, coming to take the child away from them. Bagheera taught Mowgli the rules of the jungle and everything he needed to know about all the animals. Bagheera was always there to protect him. The wolves told Bagheera he must take Mowgli back to the human village, where he would be safe from Shere Khan. Bagheera agreed to take Mowgli to the human village. But when he tried, Mowgli got very upset and said he wanted to stay in the jungle with all his animal friends. Mowgli ran off deep into the jungle where he met a nice new jungle bear friend named Baloo. Baloo and Mowgli played and had a great time. They met some monkeys and their king, who wanted to know how to make fire. Bagheera caught up with Baloo and Mowgli and said they had to get Mowgli to the village. But Mowgli ran away again. He wanted to stay in the jungle. Bagheera and Baloo searched for Mowgli. But... The fierce tiger Shere Khan had found Mowgli first. Mowgli, who had grown up around animals his whole life, was not the least bit afraid of Shere Khan, the great tiger. <laughs> this made Shere Khan very angry. Shere Khan bared his great fangs and let out a giant tiger roar and leapt towards Mowgli. Just then, Bagheera and Baloo arrived. Baloo the bear grabbed the great tiger by the tail and then threw him to the ground with a thud. Baloo had gotten there just in time to save Mowgli. <laughs> Shere Khan lashed about trying to reach Baloo, but Baloo hung on tight to his tail. Shere Khan tried to shake Baloo loose and cracked his strong tail like a whip. Suddenly, a big storm rose up and a huge lightning bolt hit a big tree and started a fire. Mowgli knew right away how to help Baloo with the fight against Shere Khan. Shere Khan was very afraid of fire. Mowgli took a branch that was on fire and he ran towards the great tiger. Shere Khan was so afraid of the fire in Mowgli's hand that he ran away deep into the jungle. Bagheera and Baloo cheered. They both knew they would never see Shere Khan around their jungle parts again. Mowgli, Bagheera and Baloo promised they would never be parted by anything again. They would always be best friends, no matter what. Just then, at the edge of the jungle river, 
Mowgli saw something he had never seen before. It was a beautiful girl. The beautiful girl was getting water just outside the man's village edge by the river. Bagheera and Baloo were sad, but only for a few moments, as they knew Mowgli had to leave to go to the man village with the girl. They both knew it was the right thing for Mowgli to do. They both saw Mowgli smile as he helped the girl with her water jugs at the river's edge. Then Mowgli waved as he headed towards the man village with the girl. Mowgli's friends knew it was where Mowgli really belonged. They would always be friends no matter where they all lived. Bagheera and Baloo knew they had done the right thing by helping Mowgli find his way safely to his new home and they all lived happily ever after. A long time ago, Mr. and Mrs. Darling lived in London, England with their children, Wendy, Michael, John, and their sweet dog, Nana. Wendy was always telling her brothers stories about a magical place called Neverland, where a magical boy named Peter Pan lived. No one ever grew old in Neverland. It was full of mermaids, Indians, fairies, and some wicked pirates, too. One night, as Wendy told her brothers a bedtime tale of Neverland, magically, Peter Pan and a magic fairy appeared. Peter Pan wanted Wendy to come with him back to Neverland and never grow old. She agreed as long as her two brothers could come too. The magic fairy sprinkled her fairy dust to help them fly. And soon, Peter Pan had taught Wendy, Michael, and John how to fly. Back in Neverland, Captain Hook was searching for Peter Pan. He was going to capture him once and for all. Peter Pan took Wendy to the Mermaid Lagoon, while Michael and John went off exploring with Peter Pan's friends, the Lost Boys. In the meantime, Captain Hook had taken Tiger Lily, Peter Pan's friend, prisoner. The captain demanded that Tiger Lily tell him where Peter Pan's secret hiding place is. Mr. Shmee, Captain Hook's helper, was a bad person and he helped Captain Hook put Tiger Lily in danger. All of a sudden, Peter Pan flew in and rescued Tiger Lily from Mr. Smee and Captain Hook. He rescued her just in time. Captain Hook had another plan. Mr. Shmee would find the magical fairy and she would help them find Peter Pan's secret hiding spot. Mr. Shmee found the fairy, and she was willing to help because she had become jealous of Wendy. And Captain Hook promised to leave Neverland and kidnap Wendy to take her with him. Because of the promise, the fairy showed Mr. Shmee and Captain Hook on a map where Peter Pan's secret hideout was. Immediately, <laughs> Captain Hook said, Thank you, nice fairy and then locked her up in a cage. The captain and his crew found the secret hideout and captured everyone but Peter Pan. Captain Hook lowered a bomb into the hideout to blast away Peter Pan. But meanwhile, the fairy had escaped to warn Peter Pan about the bomb. The bomb went off, but Peter Pan and the fairy escaped. But Captain Hook had no idea about that. Happy with his prisoners, Captain Hook loaded them on his ship. He gave them all only two choices. Become pirates or walk the plank, said Captain Hook. Wendy bravely said, we will never join you, as she slowly walked onto the plank. She stepped off the end and vanished into thin air. 
without even a splash. Michael and John looked on in fear. All of a sudden, they all heard Peter Pan's voice. He had saved Wendy by catching her before she splashed into the water. A great battle started between Peter Pan and Captain Hook. Peter Pan won the battle and threw Captain Hook overboard. The ship was now Peter Pan's. Peter ordered his crew to sail the ship to London to take Wendy, John and Michael back home. Peter Pan knew Wendy and her brothers had to return home. Wendy and her brothers were so happy to be returning home to London. The ship reached Mr. and Mrs. Darling's home and dropped off Wendy, Michael and John. Peter Pan and his friends were not ready to grow up just yet, so they turned the ship around to sail back to Neverland with Peter Pan and the fairy too. Wendy and her brothers waved goodbye from their window as Peter Pan and his ship sailed out of sight towards Neverland. Wendy knew in her heart she must start to grow up soon, but no matter how old she got, she would never forget her wonderful adventures in Neverland with Peter Pan and all of his amazing friends. <laughs>